This week's episode of Brainwaves and the following message are brought to you by NatureBox, snacking made healthy. I know, grocery shopping is difficult when you're on call or when you're addicted to Netflix. NatureBox makes snacking easier and healthy. From sriracha-coated cashews to pumpkin spice chocolate chip biscotti, there's something for every palate. Get three free snacks when you sign up on brainwaves.me. Hi, everyone. Welcome to Brainwaves. I'm your host, as uh, usual, Ali Hamadani. Wait, what are you talking about? Well, I thought we said I'm interviewing you this time. No, it's still my podcast. I still have to do the intros. Welcome back to Brainwaves. I'm Jim Siegler, and today on the show, I've got Dr. Ali Hamidani here, who's trying to take over, <laughs> uh, but I guess instead of the usual routine where I get to interview him, he's going to try to pimp me on some interesting neurologic topics. So what are we going to talk about today, Ali? So today I'd like to ask you a little bit about venous disease. This falls well within your interest in stroke. And I remember as a junior resident, that was always something that I never wanted to miss. It was uh, really harped on me not to miss that. It can present in a lot of different ways. So I'd like to hear sort of how you approach venous disease clinically and uh, in sort of diagnosis and treatment. So maybe we'll just start off by asking, when should you suspect venous disease? Well, I'm not a vein kind of person, but I guess if we're talking about the veins of the brain, it is something that you should suspect in a lot of different scenarios where something doesn't quite add up. And cortical vein thrombosis or cerebral venous sinus thrombosis, it can present in a lot of ways. A lot of times it can present with an indolent kind of headache that's been going on for a couple of days. Sometimes it can present with focal deficits, whether it localizes to a certain arterial distribution or not. They, these patients often complain of headache and some sort of new or progressively worsening symptom. It's not like an acute ischemic stroke where symptoms are always abrupt and onset and they have lost the ability that they previously had. It's going to be something a little more slow for the most part. It's also in your differential diagnosis for worst headache of life and thunderclap headaches. And uh, another interesting symptom that some patients often present with is, you know, seizure. So, you know, stroke can present with seizure, intracranial hemorrhage can present with seizure. So cortical vein thrombosis and cerebral venous sinus thrombosis can also present with seizure. So in any patient who has any of these kind of symptoms and something doesn't quite add up or the neuroimaging isn't perfect for what looks like an arterial distribution of a stroke or a hemorrhage that's a little bit unusual, then I suspect a cortical vein or cerebral venous sinus thrombosis. So uh, I thought it was interesting that you mentioned both ischemia and hemorrhage as presenting symptoms of sinus thrombosis because that's always been a little bit kind of counterintuitive to me. Can you talk a little bit more about kind of how those things happen and what, like if you saw a hemorrhage, would make you suspect uh, venous thrombosis as the underlying cause? I think that's a great question, and it really gets to the pathophysiology of what we think about when we see a cerebral venous sinus thrombosis. In general, there is ischemia that's due to venous occlusion, so there's a backup in the flow of blood out from the brain. And so, whereas with arterial ischemia, there's a lack of nutrients and oxygen that are getting to the tissues now, the nutrients are getting there, but they can't leave. And so that tissue does not remain perfused or doesn't continue to perfuse normally. Tissue will appear like it is infarcting on head CT, but on head CT, if you do see some signs of venous infarction, it typically spans multiple different arterial distributions. So maybe ACA and MCA distribution or PCA, MCA, or deep gray structures, and then also frontal and parietal, kind of depending on the distribution of the cortical vein or cerebral venous sinus thrombosis. Also, it can span different hemispheres, so you can get both hemispheres or, you know, one hemisphere and the, and the cerebellum, which would also not perfectly fit a certain arterial territory. And then as far as hemorrhages, so hemorrhage is going to be a secondary complication due to the venous obstruction. So as the blood does not flow outwards, there is this kind of buildup of pressure in, in those arterial structures. And with that pressure builds up, the small blood vessels are prone to rupturing. And then you get these kind of atypical fluffier hemorrhages that don't look more confluent like you would see in a primary intracerebral hemorrhage from hypertension, for example. Got it. Yeah, whenever I see hemorrhage and we suspect sinus thrombosis, I always think of one of our stroke attendings, Steve Massey, whose favorite thing was to show a picture of a hemorrhage on a CT or an MRI and ask, should we anticoagulate this patient? So we'll talk about treatment a little bit later, but that was always a favorite of mine. I have a question for you about nomenclature. So there's like 5 million abbreviations for this out there. There's CSVT, CVT, DSVT, and you can tell me which one is your favorite, but sort of along those lines, the distinction between cortical veins and dural sinuses, what does that mean to you? I think it just describes where the venous occlusion is. So in general, those are all venous occlusions, venous thromboses 
but they describe different locations. So a dural venous thrombosis is going to be one that affects the veins, uh, kind of coating the, the cerebrum and the tentorium of the cerebellum through the dura, uh, where these large veins are. And a cortical vein thrombosis in general is going to be more of your smaller bridging veins that fall along the convexity of the cerebrum. You know, your vein of Trillard, your vein of LeBay are going to be in that in that group of different venous thromboses. When people say cerebral venous sinus thrombosis, they kind of allude to all of them. It's not as accurate of a descriptor. And so sometimes it can be important to acknowledge which one it is. So a cortical vein thrombosis may present um, with a lot less intracranial hypertension, for example, but it can still present with the same kind of, you know, focal neurologic deficits, seizures, hemorrhage. Um, whereas if you see a dural vein thrombosis, it's usually a larger caliber vessel. The occlusion produces more intracranial hypertension and patients can, you know, more quickly deteriorate from that. So we talked a bit about clinical manifestations of venous thrombosis. Um, Why don't you tell me a little bit about, like, if you suspect venous disease, how to uh, sort of diagnose it radiographically? Are there any signs on just conventional imaging that can be helpful? And if not, or, you know, if that's not quite enough, uh, how do you approach dedicated venous imaging? So before you even get the imaging, you want to, you know, make sure you got a good history and assess for certain risk factors that will raise your pretest probability that you will see something because sometimes you do see abnormal looking arterial infarcts in the setting of, you know, mitochondrial disease like MELAS. And, you know, you may think of venous sinus thrombosis, but that may not always be the case. So if patients have certain risk factors, like they're hypercoagulable from occult malignancy, or if they're older, um, if they're dehydrated, if they're on oral contraceptives, you know, you want to be aware of those risk factors. Um, if they have an underlying systemic illness, if they're septic, they may or may not be in DIC, that can increase their risk of thrombosis. Um, and, you know, certain non-modifiable risk factors as well, like younger age and female sex, those are also, um, those also put you at a higher risk of a cerebral venous sinus thrombosis. As far as what you see on the imaging goes, you know, your non-contrast head CT is going to be your first imaging modality in any patient who comes in with a headache and acute focal neurologic deficit just to rule out intracerebral hemorrhage. You know, on the head CT, you could see absolutely nothing. You could actually see some small area of hypoattenuation that doesn't look like it respects the vascular territory like an acute arterial stroke would. And sometimes due to the vasogenic edema from the cortical vein or cerebral venous sinus thrombosis, you can see changes in the different areas of vasogenic edema. So there may be some small parieto occipital hypodensity on the first CT scan, and you may repeat it after a couple of hours due to fluctuating symptoms. And then now you see more of a frontal parietal um, area of hypoattenuation. That's just due to kind of fluctuating vasogenic edema patterns that change as uh, the brain kind of re-regulates this blood flow. Sometimes you'll see some, you know, hyperdense vessel on a non-contrast head CT, the so-called cord sign for a cortical vein thrombosis. It looks like a very hyperdense vessel, and um, unlike the hyperdense MCA or hyperdense basilar, which would be, you know, arterial signs for an acute ischemic stroke. Sometimes patients come in and we're doing more and more CTAs these days to look for, you know, large vessel occlusions in, in patients with stroke because now we can reperfuse them with thrombectomy techniques. And uh, with this type of study, you might see an empty delta sign if there was a thrombosis in the confluence of the sinuses in the posterior occipital area. So you might see some inadequate filling or filling defect in the venous contamination phase in a, a contrast enhanced study. After you get the head CT, you know, an MRI is going to be a much more accurate study in determining whether or not there's going to be a venous thrombosis or not. And within the first couple of days, after about five days or so, you end up seeing this T1 hyperdense vessel that would align with where you would expect a cortical vein or a dural vein. Um, you can also see some sort of, you know, flare T2 changes that are consistent with vasogenic or cytotoxic edema. And then obviously, if there's an unusual pattern of hemorrhage uh, around the area of a thrombosed vein, uh, either on MRI or CT scan, that can be very telling. It's important to realize that the, the hemorrhage patterns are going to be very unusual. They could affect multiple hemispheres. They can be intraparenchymal and extraparenchymal, so that there could be a subdural component to it, as well as a subarachnoid or intraventricular component. You know, if you see certain patterns of hemorrhages that just don't add up, then you, you've always got to think about venous sinus thrombosis. It's something you don't want to miss because it will worsen uh, if not appropriately treated and if not rapidly treated. So if you're not lucky enough to see an empty delta or a T1 hyperintensity in the dural sinuses, you need dedicated venous imaging. Can you tell us a little bit about CT venograms versus MR venograms? Is there a preference for one over the other? 
sort of what are the advantages and disadvantages and the you know need for contrast in these studies. Well, I think that a CT venogram and an MR venogram have comparable sensitivities and specificities. Uh, a CT venogram is going to give you a little bit more sensitivity at looking for cortical venous thromboses as opposed to the MRV, which may miss some of those smaller veins. Uh, it's just a less sensitive technique. In general, you know, CT venogram is probably going to be your faster scan. And if you have a high suspicion for it early on, you can get the non-contrast head CT with the CT venogram at the same time. And it's done within a matter of minutes, whereas an MR venogram is going to take, you know, an hour or so with a dedicated MRI study. The risks and benefits are very different between these two modalities, and they're as you would expect. So the radiation exposure and contrast exposure uh, in a CT scan is uh, going to be different for somebody who has some acute on chronic kidney disease or if they're pregnant. Um, that's something to consider. And then also uh, in patients who have end-stage renal disease and they're on hemodialysis, you're going to want to avoid gadolinium when you obtain that MRI to look for the venous sinus thrombosis. You mentioned earlier that infarcts and hemorrhage in venous thrombosis occur in unusual places. And just I kind of infer from that that what you mean is that they don't occur in arterial distributions. Are there any specific venous distributions that people should know about when they look at imaging? Yeah, I think that if you see bihemispheric or bithalamic infarctions or even infarctions with associated hemorrhage, that should certainly raise your suspicion that this is going to be a venous infarction. A thrombosis of the straight sinus, for example, will cause bithalamic infarcts with or without hemorrhage, and those patients can deteriorate very rapidly unless appropriately treated. You know, we had a patient who came in recently who had bifrontal hemorrhages that were thought to be traumatic, but the patient ended up having an occlusion of the superior sagittal sinus. So as the blood was supposed to be draining from the bifrontal convexities, the patient actually like wasn't draining appropriately and developed bifrontal venous infarcts with hemorrhage. Getting back to imaging, I feel like one thing that comes up a lot is you get venous imaging because you're concerned about venous thrombosis and you get this report back that says uh, hypoplastic transverse sinus but no clear thrombosis and when I'm looking at those images myself I'm not sure that if I didn't have that hint that I would necessarily arrive at the same conclusion so are there any clues uh, when looking at imaging you know especially with all these uh, anomalies of normal venous anatomy how you can distinguish normal variation from pathology that's a great question, and that definitely plagues some of the readers for multiple imaging modalities, just knowing like what's a normal variation and what's not normal. You know, For instance, sometimes you'll see what looks to be like a filling defect in arterial distribution um, with some blood flow kind of going around it, but it may just be a fenestrated vessel instead of an occluded vessel. For venous imaging, you, know, you want to know the body is not perfectly symmetric. It's going to be very unlikely that you have you have exact similarities in sizes of different vessels. And to call one vessel hypoplastic um, versus another is probably just going to be on the spectrum of normal. When you look at the vessel and you want to know if it's hypoplastic or if it's stenotic or occluded, um, there are a couple of things that can be telling. And I think the most telling feature is going to be for patients who have a sigmoid sinus thrombosis, which is not an uncommon location for a venous sinus thrombosis. So for a sigmoid sinus thrombosis, for example, you can really get an idea of what the sigmoid sinus should look like by looking at the sigmoid notch in the temporal bone. Most of the time, the sigmoid notch is proportionate in size to the sigmoid vessel, and if there's inadequate filling or it looks like there may be a smaller vessel around a larger notch, uh, then maybe there could be a thrombus in that vessel. But if you do see that the sigmoid notch is small and you can't really appreciate the vessel, then there may not be any significant pathology in that venous part of the system. Let's talk now a little bit about treatment. So how do you treat a venous occlusion? So there are a lot of ways to treat it, and each way kind of addresses specific underlying problems that are associated with venous infarcts and, or venous occlusions. Especially with dural venous thromboses, uh, one of the major threats to life is intracranial hypertension, and you want to really reduce that intracranial pressure as quickly as possible and as safely as possible. Ironically enough, even with patients who have hemorrhage from the venous thrombosis, heparinization or therapeutic anticoagulation is going to be indicated. In some cases, heparinization is not going to be enough, in which case you might consider thrombectomy or more kind of aggressive techniques. Some patients have really large infarcts or hemorrhage, in which case you might want to do surgical decompression to kind of allow the brain to swell. And a lot of people find it a bit counterintuitive to anticoagulate someone with intracerebral hemorrhage. So how do you reconcile that? I think you really have to think about the underlying mechanism of injury. And the mechanism of the hemorrhage is due to venous infarction and buildup of pressure behind uh, that area. 
So relieving that pressure can only really be achieved by either physical you know, thrombectomy and recanalization of that occluded vein or anticoagulation in order to dissolve that clot. Although it may seem you know, counterintuitive that treating with anticoagulation may increase the risk of hemorrhage, it actually is used to prevent further hemorrhage and propagation of infarct. So when patients have hopefully stabilized and intracranial pressure is no longer a concern, at some point you have to switch their IV anticoagulation to something oral. So what do you choose and for how long do you anticoagulate them? Again, this depends kind of on the underlying pathophysiology. If somebody has a venous sinus thrombosis due to a malignancy, for example, they may require lifelong anticoagulation to prevent further thrombosis. These days we like to use the direct oral anticoagulants whenever possible. Some people still rely on warfarin. And uh, typical durations for treatment of a cerebral venous sinus thrombosis is three to six months according to the American Heart Association. But longer treatment intervals can be indicated in other situations like cancer and conditions where there may be recurrence of a cerebral venous thrombosis. And do you re-image as an outpatient ever to guide the duration of your therapy? I don't know that many people use re-imaging as a means to discontinue anticoagulation early or as an indication to continue anticoagulation indefinitely, but sometimes it's helpful to reassure the patient with you know, normalization of imaging that you know, it seems like whatever the issue was, it seems to have resolved and it would be safe to discontinue anticoagulation after the recommended duration of therapy. All right, well, I think that's all the questions I have. Do you want to sign off or should I, like... Why don't you try it, Ali? All right, Jim, well, thanks for sharing your thoughts on venous thrombosis. I know I've learned a ton uh, talking to you, as I always do, and I look forward to the next one. All right, thanks, Ali. Appreciate it. All right, in case you fell asleep and just woke up, we just heard Jim Siegler talk about sinus thrombosis. Uh, I'm Ali Hamadani. Thanks for joining us on Brainwaves. Special shout out to MMFFF. Loyalty Freak Music, Josh Woodward, Andy Cohen, and Steve Coombs for providing the music. See you next time. All right. Did you like the in case you fell asleep business? Yeah, that was good. Okay.